very warm welcome to this online EMF conference. Thank you for joining us. Your presence is a real encouragement to us. We had hoped that this conference would be what we now have to describe as an in-person conference, which is something we've been doing around this time of the year for a number of years, but for obvious reasons that hasn't been possible this time, which is why of course we're meeting online. But we're thankful for the technology that makes it possible for us to do something as opposed to doing nothing. And I think we can safely say that some of you, probably quite a few of you, wouldn't have been able to attend an in-person conference because of the distance or the cost of the journey or whatever. So we're especially glad that you've been able to join us today. And that leads us to the theme of today's conference, the message and the medium sharing the gospel in an online world. An important, very relevant, and I would say fascinating subject. And to help us to think about sharing the gospel in an online world, we have five guest speakers with us today. John Stevens, who's the National Director of the FIEC and an EMF trustee. Andrew Roycroft, pastor of Mill Isle Baptist Church in Northern Ireland. Stefano and Jenny Mariotti, who are EMF missionaries in Budrio, not far from Bologna in the north of Italy and Vitali Mariash, another EMF missionary and the academic dean of Kiev Theological Seminary in Ukraine. We're grateful to all of them for being willing to help us in our thinking about such an important subject. And we're really looking forward to hearing what they'll be sharing with us. We'll also be watching three videos from EMF missionaries in Italy, Poland and Spain, which means that counting the UK will be having input today from five different European countries, Italy, Poland, Spain, Ukraine and the UK. Our first speaker, John Stevens, will be addressing the subject, sharing the gospel in an online world, the challenge facing the church. But before I hand over to John, let's pray. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for this opportunity of being together, albeit online. We thank you that you are the omnipresent God and that you are with us now, present with us at this conference. And we pray for your blessing upon us as we think together about such an important matter as how to make known the gospel, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ in this online world in which we live and at this time of crisis in which we find ourselves. Lord, we pray that you will guide our thoughts, that you will help all those who will be taking part this afternoon in this conference, not only the speakers and the missionaries and those responsible for the technical side, but also all those attending this conference today, that you would make our time together a real blessing to our souls, uh, to our souls, not only interesting, but edifying, and that it may spur us all on to do more with your spirit's help to make the wonderful news about Jesus known to more and more people, whatever country we live in or find ourselves in. So help us, we pray, and may this conference be above all for your glory through the ongoing progress of the gospel all over Europe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John, for being willing to take part in today's conference. So I'll just hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, and um, welcome everybody. Good afternoon from me. And it's a real privilege to be able to be with you this afternoon and begin um, your conference as we turn to God's word. Um, and I'm also really looking forward to hearing from uh, all the different missionaries in different parts of Europe um, about how the gospel is advancing and progressing. So it's great to be with you. Um, I'm going to be um, speaking from Romans chapter 10. So as we begin our time, I want to read from Romans 10 verses 1 to 15. So if you've got a Bible, or you can uh, look at it on a device, Romans 10, 1 to 15. 
Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there be, may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes about the righteousness that is by law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will descend into heaven, that's to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? How can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for your word. Uh, we uh, ask and pray that you might speak to us, give us ears to hear, and might we um, uh, respond with renewed faith and obedience. Uh, thank you especially for this great task of the gospel of sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus um, uh, with others so that they can come to um, salvation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's no doubt that in the last 30 years, life has been transformed by the Internet. I remember I was a student between 1986 and 1990. And in those four years, I didn't use a computer once. My uh, daughter, who's 18, went to university in September. She's a first year student at Leeds. And now she finds that virtually all of her teaching is uh, online and she hardly has to leave um, her room. The internet and the online world that it's created has become part and parcel of our everyday life. And it's easy to forget how relatively recent uh, that has been. It was only in 1976 that the internet was invented when uh, computers were uh, able to talk to one another. It was 1989 when Tim Berners-Lee uh, created the World Wide Web for the first time. The first smartphone or smartphone-like device was introduced by IBM in 1992. And the first iPhone was only in 2007. It was only in 2004 that Facebook was founded. So it's all relatively recent. But this recent COVID crisis, as I think brought down to us, uh, brought home to us both the dependence we have on the internet, but also the versatility of the internet. In many countries, including my own, churches have been closed and services had to move uh, online or, or were live streamed. It was a, a real blessing in a time in which people were not able to go to church physically. The internet has revolutionized life, but we know that that's not always been for the good. There's been a danger that uh, real relationships, physical relationships, have been replaced by virtual uh, relationships. Physical friendships have been replaced by online friendships. Shopping online has replaced uh, the high street. Uh, internet dating has been a, a, a means to greater se sexual promiscuity. And tragically, the main use of the internet is still for pornography. Gambling um, uh, is ubiquitous uh, online. As a result of the uh, internet, perhaps people are no longer connected with their local communities in the way that they were, but they live in a virtual world. The internet opens itself up to people creating fraudulent identities. And of course, uh, the internet has had an impact on churches as well. As uh, churches and preachers and ministries have gone online, there have been those who've turned from membership of their local church to instead trust in celebrity pastors, to listen to sermons online. 
uh, the uh, sort of internet has enabled multi-site churches to be established where you don't have a physical preacher. It's enabled the growth of mega churches, sometimes at the expense of smaller churches. And the internet is full of all different kinds of false teaching and false teachers. But despite all of those negatives, I want to suggest that um, the online world, the internet, also provides us with amazing opportunities for evangelism. All forms of technology, all advances can either be used for good uh, or uh, for ill. But I think that we need to grasp the opportunities that the uh, internet and the online world open up for us. To some extent, the COVID crisis has opened our eyes to those opportunities. So I want to ask, what are the implications for the church for evangelism and mission of this uh, online world? Well, the first thing I want to say is that the essential challenge we face is the same, that lost people need to be saved. That's actually the essential message of the letter to the Romans. Paul was writing this letter to encourage um, the Christians in Rome to support his world mission and evangelism. He wanted them to back him as he took the gospel um, to Spain. He wanted them to do that because uh, it's the gospel that is the power of God for salvation. And Paul wrote to them to remind them that humanity has rebelled against God and has been given over to sin and death. But the glorious good news is that Jesus came to die as a sacrifice for sins so that they could be redeemed, set free from death and given the gift of eternal life and be declared to be righteous and in a right relationship with God. In uh, Romans chapter 10 that we uh, read, Paul is expressing his concern for his own Jewish people. And what he does in these verses is he um, makes a specific application of these general principles. He reminds his readers that salvation comes by hearing and believing the gospel message. Lost people are saved when they confess Jesus as Lord and when they believe in their hearts that he is risen from the dead. And people need to hear this good news because they don't innately know the righteousness of God. Instead, they seek salvation by their own works. They try to create a righteousness of their own that's not by faith in Jesus, but that is hopeless and does not save. Paul in these verses expresses his longing that the Jews would come to salvation. He wants them to hear and respond to the gospel, but so few are yet have believed. Well, I think the challenge that Paul is describing in this letter and in these verses is exactly the same challenge that we face uh, today. In the continent of Europe, there's a population of about 733 million people. And of those 733 million people, the best statistics would suggest that no more than 2.5% are evangelical believers in the Lord Jesus, no more than about 18 million. The vast majority of the population of our continent um, are, are those who are lost, and in need of Christ. The vast majority don't confess Jesus as Lord. They don't believe that he's risen from the dead. They're still in bondage to sin. They're destined to die and headed to eternal judgment. They don't know the righteousness of God. I think as we think about the uh, uh, sort of technological changes uh, of our world, there's a danger of us mystifying the online world and of being intimidated by it. For many of us, that's simply because we don't keep up with technology easily. But the reality is that the online world is still the same world in which men and women are under sin. It's a world in which the problem is still the same problem, that people deserve death because of their rebellion against God. It's a world in which the solution is the same solution the perfect obedience and propitiatory sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. It's a world in which the, uh, the salvation is the same salvation, faith in Jesus, which leads to being justified uh, uh, and freed from condemnation. In the face of the great need that Paul saw amongst the Jewish people and their unbelief, he prayed 
in, in verse one, we, we hear of his passionate prayer for his people. His heart's desire and prayer was that they would be saved. One of the challenges for us in our world is do we have that same passionate concern for those who are lost? Do we have that same passionate concern for the lost people of Europe? The essential challenge that we face is the same. Uh, lost people need to be saved. Well, secondly, the essential means we use are the same. Lost people need to hear the gospel. Paul explains in these verses um, how to meet this challenge. People need to be saved, but how can that happen? Well, the answer is they need to hear the gospel. After all, Paul said in Romans 1.17 that it's the gospel that's the power of God for salvation. And if they're to hear the gospel, they need to have someone preach it to them. Paul in verses 14 and 15 describes a, a logical chain. Lost people can't call on the Lord Jesus and confess his name if they don't hear of him. Uh, they can't hear of him unless someone preaches the good news to them. Uh, no one can preach the gospel to them unless someone is sent, which I think here primarily means someone is funded to go and do the work of preaching the gospel to them. Uh, our great task is to keep uh, preaching uh, the gospel to ensure that people hear the good news about the Lord Jesus. And that means that we need people to go, to go and do the speaking. It means we need people to send who will do the supporting and the funding. The results of the preaching of the gospel and the sending of people to preach the gospel is ultimately a matter for the sovereignty of God. But it's our responsibility to send and to uh, speak. And Paul says this is a beautiful task of bringing good news to people. These verses remind us that gospel ministry is ultimately all about verbal proclamation. Our task is to make an announcement about Jesus, who he is, what he's done, how we should respond to him. It's to issue a command to people to repent in his name and with his authority. It's to offer forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. And none of that has changed in an online world. It's possible that people have heard and have not believed. That's uh, in many ways Paul's point about the Jews. The problem is not that they've not heard, that nobody's gone and told them. They have heard, but they haven't responded. That's why he's uh, wanting to go to the Gentiles to take the gospel to those uh, in Spain who'd not heard. But despite all of its Christian history, I think that in contemporary Europe, the vast majority of people have not truly heard the gospel. They might have heard a perverted version of the gospel. They might have heard a gospel of good works, a gospel of uh, re religion, a gospel of human righteousness. But the majority of those 733 million people have not heard the authentic, true, apostolic gospel. The essential means that we use are, are, are the same. It doesn't matter whether it was the first century or whether it's our online world. Lost people need to hear the gospel. And then thirdly, that brings us to our final point which is that the internet, the online world, is a wonderful opportunity. It's a way of enabling more lost people to hear the gospel. I think the internet has opened up unprecedented opportunities to share the gospel with others, and that we need to embrace and make the most of that opportunity. It doesn't replace the other ways we seek to reach out to people through the local church and in person. I'm not saying that at all but it does offer new opportunities that enable us to share the gospel more widely. The COVID crisis has enabled us to, grasp a grim, to glimpse um, something of the potential uh, of the internet. It's uh, shown us how the, uh, the internet and an online presence can overcome the limits of friendship evangelism as we're able to reach people that we don't know. It's able to overcome the barriers of distance and location. It enables us to reach people that we could never physically meet. For some people, it overcomes the difficulty of attending church 
or an event in person. It allows people to come anonymously. And that can be really helpful where people face cultural barriers to, face, to faith. Maybe in a closed countries where evangelism is um, illegal. It, it's, a, it's effective and even the major form of evangelism. It's a complement to our physical ministry that can never replace church. And uh, Christians, disciples, need to be discipled in the life of the body of the church. But at the same time, in the New Testament, we see that the vast majority of evangelism takes place outside of the church. We need to go to people with the message rather than expecting them to come to us. And the uh, online world offers us new opportunities to be able to do that. In many ways, I think we need to see the online world as the contemporary equivalent of the ancient marketplace. It's where ideas and messages were uh, are disseminated, where people can discuss them and engage with them. It's a place where we can preach the good news of the Lord Jesus. And historically, and in God's sovereignty and providence, the work of the gospel and mission has always taken advantage of technology to be able to spread the word even more effectively. It's not something we should despise or fear, but instead something we should use. The very nature of the gospel as a verbal message, a verbal proclamation about Jesus, means that it doesn't have to be communicated in physical person. The saving power is in the word, not in the person who's speaking. In the first century, for example, uh, one of the reasons the gospel was able to spread was because of the benefits of the Roman Empire, which ensured peace, a common language, transport through a system of roads. It enabled the, the apostles to travel widely. It enabled their letters to be circulated. They were able to teach at a distance. They could communicate with congregations by writing to them. Luke and John wrote evangelistic accounts of Jesus' life so that the, uh, the, the account of Jesus could spread to many more people than Luke or John could speak to personally. At the time of the uh, Reformation, one of the key factors in the success of the Reformation was the development of printing that enabled the production of pamphlets, tracts and books. It was one of the major differences. There'd been earlier reform movements, people like Huss and Wycliffe, but they hadn't been able to spread uh, the message um, in the same way because printing wasn't available. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, very rapidly, they were translated from Latin to German and printed and distributed. They had a wide impact across the whole of Germany. Between 1517 and 1546, Martin Luther wrote 2,721 works and more than 3 million copies were printed and distributed. It was the invention of printing that enabled Bibles to be put in people's hands. Or think of Whitfield and Wesley, who pioneered preaching in the open air, not in a church building. They went to where people were and they spoke to mass crowds of thousands. They were the pioneers of stadium evangelism. Or think of the missionary movement that took advantage of advances in travel and medicine. Think, for example, of the founding of MAF, making use of aeroplanes to uh, help missionaries be able to spread the gospel. Think of Spurgeon, who had his sermons printed and sold as the penny pulpit. Thousands of people who could not attend the Metropolitan Tabernacle read his sermons. And a, a more modern era, sermons have been recorded. Martin Lloyd-Jones recording a tape ministry that impacted way beyond the scope of the church. Well, think of radio ministry that was able to reach into the communist world in the 20th century. Or the use of films. Billy Graham started releasing in 1953 and the Billy Graham Association would say two million people have responded making decisions for Christ. Think of the use of television. The SAT-7 broadcasting system reaching out into the Middle East and North Africa. 25 million people have watched. 
one in four Saudi Arabian children have engaged with their children's programs. And the internet is simply an extension of these ways the word can be proclaimed. 2016, uh, 190 million people in Europe had broadband. In 2019, 90% had uh, the internet. In 2019, there were 347 mobile phone users. There's massive smartphone penetration, 80% of the people in Germany, 60% of the people in Greece. These are great ways that we're able to communicate the gospel. And we've seen that in lockdown. As churches have moved online, more people have listened in. Uh, evangelism and events have been able to take place online and some non-Christians have found it less embarrassing to engage uh, in a, a sort of a virtual uh, group rather than coming physically. Uh, they find it, um, uh, they don't have to travel, they don't have to come, uh, they can leave easily if they feel embarrassed. It's, it's convenient for them. Across the FIEC, our 630 churches, we've heard report after report after report of people being converted through online gospel ministry. The danger uh, for us often, I think, as conservatives is we're not e early adopters. We uh, find it difficult to make changes and adopt new technology. We see its dangers before we see its opportunities. But I think as we think about evangelism and gospel ministry in an online world, we need to see the remarkable opportunities that the internet gives us to be able to share the good news of the Lord Jesus. The essential challenge we face is the same. Lost people need to hear of Jesus. The essential means is the same. Lost people need someone to preach the gospel to them. And the online world offers a remarkable opportunity to do that. Let's make the most of it. Uh, well, uh, my name is Phil Dunn and I'm the EMF Northern Ireland representative and I'm going to be guiding us through the programme uh, today. Thank you so much, John, for that very clear and compelling explanation of the challenges, the means, the opportunities that we have to engage with others uh, using the internet. Now, we are going to set sail and travel across to the beautiful land of Italy. And we're going to meet EMF missionaries Stefano and Jenny Mariotti. Stefano and Jenny have been involved in planting the Church La Piazza in Budrio since 2012. Budrio is a town of about 20,000 people and is situated near Bologna in north central Italy. Now, the church plant started as a vision between the church in San Lazaro, uh, where Stefano was previously pastoring, and another church in Bologna. And over the years, the Bidrio church has gradually grown, and now there are between 25 to 30 people meeting regularly. Isn't that encouraging? And recently, they had the great pleasure and privilege of having a baptismal service. And just now, we're going to watch a short video of that very memorable and moving event. And after that, Stefano was going to speak to us about sharing the gospel in an online world. Two thousand twenty has been uh, the most uh, difficult year for our small church plant in Budrio, but uh, the light uh, of this difficult year through all the COVID, uh, all the lockdowns, uh, was really a possibility that the Lord gave us uh, this summer in September to do an open air baptismal service, uh, where more than one hundred people were able to attend, uh, and we did a joint service with the Church of San Lazzaro. This lady that you can see here is Grazia. Grazia moved to Budrio quite a few years ago now, and uh, we got to know her um, at a local event in our town. It was a food festival, and as a church, we all made food from our native regions, and we produced a recipe book 
with recipes in and also our testimonies. And it was as we were doing this event in our town that we met Grazia. She just turned up and uh, she saw food from Sicily. She's from Sicily. And we got speaking to her and we were able to share the gospel with her. And she gradually started coming to church. And we've been doing Bible studies with her, baptismal course. And it's just been a real joy to see how in spite of so many difficulties, Grazia's really grown in faith and uh, she's really become part of our church. Whereas here you can see Ezio being baptized by Giovanni from our church. Ezio is actually a neighbor of Giovanni and Simona, this, this couple you see here. And Ezio has an amazing history of really how he passed from being totally anti-Christian to showing a genuine faith in the Lord and also sharing his faith with uh, people in the hospital through his difficult life uh, is really amazing. And also here you can see Ercolina, uh, like I mentioned, we did a joint service uh, with the Church of San Lazzaro, and we really alternated uh, someone from San Lazzaro, someone from Buddha being baptized. Uh, it was a joyful experience to this partnership together with them. And also to hear the story of us, how the Lord saved Ercolina and work in her life. Here you can see Raffaella. Raffaella is part of the church in Budrio. She's a teenager and we got to know her a few years ago when she started coming to our MySpace club on Friday afternoons. She also came to our summer camp exchange and it was through attending these things that she really, really got interested in the gospel. And she went home and she shared the gospel with her mom and dad, Tony and Tiziana, and they got baptized a couple of years ago. And so it was just a real joy to be able to baptize Raphael as well. Um, she's just been such an encouragement to our church. Whereas here again you can see Manuela from San Lazzaro and soon we'll see Vittorio. And uh, it was a great opportunity to do a joint service. We knew the Church of San Lazzaro too was struggling to find a venue for their baptisms. And so really why we had this possibility for an open air event we joined with them and it was a great opportunity. So the mayor of Budrio, he came and he stayed for the whole service and really spoke how as a church we have an impact in our community and really even doing a baptismal service we can really give hope to our towns. So we really appreciate your prayers for the work of the Lord in Budrio and also for the partnership between churches. In Italy, partnership between churches is something difficult, is challenging, but definitely we see how the Lord is blessing us through the work with the church in San Lazzaro, our church in Budrio called La Piazza, the main square, and also opportunity to reach out to our community. And as you can see here, the logo of our photographer from the town of Budrio. So, good afternoon to everyone from uh, Stefano and Jenny. Yes, we are here in uh, Budrio, Italy. And uh, it's not amazing, uh, this te technology allowing us uh, to be part of a conference uh, from uh, five different countries and joining together. And yes, uh, I would say our experience too with the uh, lockdown and all the COVID uh, really raised uh, all the issue of learning how to use technology. I actually had, in my case, uh, less than one week uh, to learn how to use uh, Zoom and to use this mean for our church. Uh, and we didn't miss uh, any um, service on the service. Uh, so one Sunday, we're still meeting in person uh, in uh, our building. Uh, and the following Sunday, we're already able to meet on Zoom. Uh, and it was interesting to see that transition uh, in churches in Italy. Suddenly, out of nothing, a lot of uh, televangelists appear. Every pastors were learning how to use all this media. And so to learn and to see all that was challenging. Uh, as you can see in uh, the previous video of our baptism, that was actually the highlight for our year as a church. So we planned to have a baptismal service on Easter Sunday, but yes, due to the lockdown, we were not able to have that. That was not possible. And so I know of some churches in Italy, they made the choice to still keep their service as planned. And someone even did a baptismal service in a home baptizing someone in a bath and streaming that service. And that was watched by a lot of people. However, we decided to still focus on our local community. For us, it was important to do an event that was meaningful and understandable for our community. And so we decided to do 
our um, to wait and to do a baptismal service, as you saw in the video, in a swimming pool, uh, and to be public and understandable for our community. So we were online from uh, March through to the end of June, uh, but from July, the town hall gave us permission to use uh, the middle school gym, uh, which is uh, in this picture that I think you'll be able to see soon. So um, this was really kind of them because it was a really nice large space. We could keep the doors and the windows open. Everybody felt really safe. And uh, it was also good for our church because we've been online for so long that it was just good to get everyone back together. It involved an awful lot of cleaning. Uh, here we have so many strict cleaning regulations. Um, and thankfully, a lot of people were on holiday over the summer. So they had more time to help come and clean. And so again, this was just good for getting everybody back as a community. Um, and it was while we were cleaning one Sunday morning after church that Stefano was outside and the middle school gym is just opposite the, the open air swimming pool that we have in Budrio. And the manager of this swimming pool, he was outside in that moment. So Stefano went over to speak to him. We know him quite well because every year when we have our summer camp, we, we go there for one day. And, um, and just speaking to him, he just had the idea to ask about our baptisms, whether it just might be possible before he closed in September to be able to do our baptisms there. And uh, the manager, he was just really happy to be asked. He'd never done it before. So he was actually really excited about this opportunity. And so because of that, we were able to do our baptisms there with Sir Lazarus Church. And it was just a really good uh, opportunity to be a witness to our community. As we said in the video that the mayor came, we also had our town photographer come. So it was just a, a really public opportunity and uh, to be a witness to our community and to invite the friends and the family of those getting baptized. And at the same time, uh, learning all this uh, new technology, all the service was live streamed on Facebook. Eh? And people from the UK and America and other friends uh, were able to watch it uh, and also to be encouraged by that. And now, well, now we are again in a new lockdown, uh, second phase of COVID, uh, how to uh, challenge and to see all this situation. So in Italy, now we are in an uh, interesting situation. So churches uh, are still allowed uh, to be open, uh, whereas uh, theaters, uh, museums, and cinemas uh, have been closed. So you can see maybe that is still uh, the bonus uh, of living in a country where is the Vatican, uh, and so that is still has a strong political influence. Uh, or maybe, unfortunately, just the issue that as churches, uh, we don't move uh, many people, and so we don't uh, have a threat uh, from the point of view as a government. Uh, but yet, it uh, was really interesting to see online a uh, lot of polemics uh, about this. Uh, so there were a lot of articles uh, uh, challenging this decision. Why churches are allowed to meet in person uh, and people can go to theaters, museums uh, or uh, cinemas. And I was reading one article because that was uh, touching us directly. As a church, uh, we rent a theater. So we actually are meeting in a theater in Budrio, and at the moment, uh, no one is able to go in this theater apart from us uh, on a Sunday morning. And so this has been really uh, affecting us uh, also locally. And so I was reading an article uh, in which was talking about uh, this situation. And uh, the journalist is very famous in Italy, was actually saying, uh, well, the issue is that uh, cinemas, uh, museums, and theaters, uh, anyway, they were struggling before the lockdown. The culture that we're living now is more of Netflix. A lot of people, they prefer to stay at home uh, on their sofa, watching TV, watching their program, posing when they want it, uh, and they not feel ready to get up, uh, get dressed, uh, to go to the theater. And so this made me really to think uh, about how we apply this uh, to our church situation. Uh, so I was really conscious, I didn't want to create a culture of a Netflix uh, church. Uh, people are actually being so comfortable online uh, and not wanting anymore to meet uh, in person. Uh, and so we made uh, a series of deliberate choices. Uh, so like I mentioned before, uh, we choose to go on uh, Zoom uh, services uh, instead of streaming uh, the service uh, or even pre-recording sermon just really to encourage uh, as much as possible an interaction uh, on watching people. So when I'm preaching on Zoom, uh, I put always the gallery view. I can see my church. I can see their reaction. Uh, I can see if they got the point uh, or they're struggling. Uh, or also I'm able to pose, uh, ask questions, uh, and to still keep an interaction uh, like they're used to. And also to have a question time uh, after the service. Uh, 
So that has been a beautiful way to use uh, this medium uh, for really honoring the message. And we've also been able to continue with having a prayer time after the sermon. So we split up into groups and uh, we try to pray the word, the word that we've just heard. This is something that we've really tried to encourage in our church. Um, another thing is that we, we thought about the music um, and we decided not to use the professionally made music uh, uh, videos that you find on YouTube, but we decided to just keep on um, with our usual amatorial level uh, that we have in our church. So um, myself and another lady, we, we made some uh, videos of um, the different hymns that we sing. So this is just a little clip from In Christ the Lord. Um, just want to thank our church online as much as we are and we want to do like that online too. Uh, we would say that our experience online has been positive, very positive. Um, in the in the beginning when we were we were on online every week, we found that a lot of people joined our services that didn't usually come. So for example, previous contacts that maybe they've moved away or, or something had happened, they joined us again. So that was a really way, good way to reconnect with them. We also found that supporters from different parts of the world uh, joined our services. And again, that was just really encouraging for us personally and also really encouraging for our church because obviously in Italy, we were, we were among the first to go through this phase. So it was just really nice to see brothers and sisters from around the world joining us. Um, we also found that um, we, we reconnected with some of the, the immigrants that we've, we've had contact with in the past. And so again, that was just really good to, to catch up again with them. Um, yeah, we also really found though that a lot of people were spiritually hungry during this period. So when we did actually open again, uh, physically in July, we had uh, a family and a couple that kind of turned up immediately. Uh, the family it was a 20 year old girl and her family she'd been writing to us during the lockdown asking when we were opening again she was really really wanting to to come to church and so the first Sunday she was there with her mom and her brother and the same thing with this other couple they were just really really waiting for for the church to get back physically and so that's been really encouraging we've had these these new contacts attending since then um and so this 20 year old girl, she's also coming to our youth meetings every month in the Bologna area. This is called Seekers, this youth meeting. Every month in the Bologna area, we have a, a meeting for young people in their late teens, early twenties um, with our church and three other churches. Uh, churches in, in Italy don't have many young people. And so we put the four churches together. So in this way, we have this really nice group. And as you can see in the picture, this is a picture that was taken in the summer when it was possible to meet uh, physically in a cafe. But tomorrow we're going back online because it's no longer possible. But this is something that's continued all through the lockdown period. It continued either online or in a cafe, whatever was possible in that moment. But it's just been really important for these young people to be able to meet each other and be encouraged being together. And yet something very important that really were, um, I was aware as a pastor, was really how to keep the church uh, in engaged and seeing each other, but also how to keep them missional. So really, I thought the ways of uh, reaching out to our community, even in a moment in which we couldn't physically meet them, in a moment in which uh, we couldn't invite people at home for meals or something like that, uh, so in the first phase of the lockdown, uh, uh, heading towards uh, um, Easter, we thought to make up a kind of a Facebook challenge, which we also put on uh, Instagram and all the social media, encouraging uh, every member in the church. So we had 16 people from 16-year-old uh, to 8-year-old, everyone uh, was involved. And every day they were making a video with a challenge, encouraging, uh, sorry, learning what they were and seeing uh, through the lockdown from the word of God uh, and then having a word of encouragement. Uh. And then uh, just before Easter, uh, I made a collection with all the videos uh, and we produced uh, three videos uh, to share online, to invite for our uh, um, Easter service. And uh, to be honest, uh, no one joined that Easter service because of this video on Facebook. Eh? But yet uh, the town hall of Budrio, they reposted this exactly video you can see now on their first Facebook page uh, and was watched by a lot of people because it was the first time in that moment of uh, 
uh, economic and moral also depression, uh, people were encouraged to see a word of hope uh, from the Lord uh, and from the Bible. So that was a great opportunity to use this medium uh, online. One thing that the lockdown really affected was our work with young people from the local area. So we couldn't do our Friday afternoon club anymore and we weren't able to do our summer camp. Um, but we wanted to keep in touch with these young people. We didn't want to lose touch with them. And so we organized an event online. Um, we invited all the ones that we'd had contact with during the last year. And so um, it was really nice. We also had the team that had been for our summer camp from America. They also joined us. And so it was a really nice afternoon. We played games and uh, we also um, shared Psalm 121 with the young people. And we really encouraged them to find their help in God during this time of COVID. As you can see in this video, we, we played lots of silly games. Um, but it was just really, really a good way to, to keep back in touch with them. And uh, some of these come to Seekers as well. Some of the older ones, they come to our Seekers Club. And also now we are, uh, like I mentioned, back in this uh, second phase, uh, in this kind of new form of uh, lockdown. And so I would say we're a bit more organized. Uh, and so alongside uh, other pastors uh, and uh, some of them involved with the Gospel Coalition Italy, we thought about uh, organizing a project uh, on a national level for Italy going on uh, Facebook and Instagram, and is dealing with the book, uh, which has done, just been translated into Italian, uh, of uh, Dane Ortlund, uh, Gentle and Lowly, and uh, saying lowly. And it's a great book uh, with 23 chapters. Uh, so for, uh, um, from the 1st of December, every day, 23 different pastors uh, will prepare a video and a meditation on each book of the, of, uh, on each chapter of this book. Uh, and this will be broadcasted uh, in many different ways. Eh? And it will be a way to engage uh, with a lot of people, pastors from all across uh, Italy. So I prepared the number 13 uh, on the Holy Spirit. Eh? And this will be used by many churches uh, really to boost uh, their uh, um, Christmas event. Uh, and also as a way to reach out uh, with uh, non-Christians. Uh. Yes, here you can see my study and my meditation. Uh, and uh, it's a great opportunity also to engage uh, and involve uh, other pastors in this. Uh. So also thinking about Christmas, um, we've been thinking about what we could do as a church, um, not really knowing what the situation will be like. So one thing that we thought we will do is we're going to make Christmas cards that we can give to our friends, to our neighbors and our colleagues. And inside the card, we're going to put a QR code that will then link to a YouTube video that just explains what Christmas is about, the real meaning of Christmas. And we'll also invite people to our Christmas service, which we don't know yet whether it will be online or physically, but we just want to be able to invite people. Um, as a church on Boxing Day, we usually have a Boxing Day project. So we uh, give chocolates and a card to the, 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 the hospital, to the doctor, to the, the police, to the fire brigade. We won't be able to do that this year exactly uh, in our usual way. But we, again, we're thinking to maybe make a card with a QR code in it that will, again, just uh, be able, they'll be able to connect that and, uh, and receive a gospel message about Christmas. And so thinking really about uh, our experience uh, of living as a small church uh, in a rural context uh, with not a lot of uh, technological people, how we can use well uh, the medium uh, to honoring uh, the message. And so really our experience is really that the medium uh, shouldn't really change uh, the message at all. So this digital medium, uh, within even this moment, uh, we definitely can say has been a God-given uh, helpful tool. But like uh, uh, John mentioned before, uh, in our experience, uh, it remains still a poor substitute uh, of the real physical interaction uh, of the body of Christ, uh, but can be definitely used uh, for the advance of the gospel and reaching out uh, generations and people that so far were difficult to reach. Uh. So on a positive element, uh, something we're actually thinking to keep uh, using, uh, even when the lockdown will be totally over, and it uh, will be really the idea of, uh, for midweek meetings. Uh, we see some of the elderly, they were actually struggling to join our meetings. Uh, so we're thinking to still have uh, real meetings, uh, but then connecting on Zoom. Uh, so people from uh, yeah, different ages or uh, situation that can still watch uh, the midweek meeting. Uh. And something that we learn uh, is actually something that uh, till before we were also struggling to be a small, uh, tiny church. Uh, 
But actually, we saw with uh, God blessing uh, that being small uh, in a moment of lockdown was actually very good uh, because we were flexible. So our experience was that we were among one of the first churches uh, be able again to meet publicly when the lockdown was over because we could rearrange quite easily and to move people around easily. Or uh, in this moment, uh, we are in what is called an orange region in Italy. So it means there are physical restrictions. People cannot travel from one town uh, to the other. But yet, because uh, as a church plant, uh, we decide to target uh, our local community. So 90% of our church live in the same town. Eh? So we don't have any problem to meet together every Sunday. And even recently, we had new people coming uh, and one lady just entering the church uh, and we were all there. So this is something that really we are thankful to the Lord from this. Eh? And yet we want to be missional and thinking how to use this medium really for the progress of the gospel in Italy and in our area. And Phil, now I pass the word back to you. Well, wasn't that inspiring? Thank you so much, uh, Stefano and Jenny, for contributing in that really helpful way. Uh, now, just at this point, we are going to press pause on our program so we can have a short comfort break. Uh, so why not stretch your legs, make a nice cup of coffee, grab a wee chalky biscuit, and then be sure to rejoin us here at four o'clock. So you've got about eight minutes or so, so you better be quick. Short break. We'll see you back here at four o'clock sharp. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your coffee and biscuit. And uh, just to say at this point that if you would like to uh, raise any questions, we're not going to have a Q&A session at the end, but you can use the, the, the chat function and we will get back to you in due course with some answers if, if something's raised that you would like to know a little bit more about. Now, it's time to share a little bit about our brand new project called Help for Happy Wheels. So what's it all about? Well, Help for Happy Wheels aims to raise funds for a new minibus for people with disabilities in the city of Ternopil, which is in Western Ukraine. The Happy Wheels ministry is run by a group of Christian volunteers led by EMF missionary and pastor Volodya Kostashin to provide transportation to people with disabilities in Ternopil. Now, this important and inspiring ministry began in 2015, but the vision for it started much earlier. Volodya and his wife, Oksana, have two sons, Zachariah, who is 15, and Alexei, who is 10 months. Sadly, Zachariah was born with severe physical and learning disabilities and requires 24-hour care, which can only be provided by his parents. Based on their own experience, Volody and Oksana have a real passion to help other U Ukrainian families with children who are disabled. Now, it's important to understand the massive need for this ministry. Social care within Ukraine is very poor indeed. And this is an historic problem. Back in Soviet times, people with disabilities would be locked away in institutions out of sight. Even today, Ukrainian society often views disability as something to be ashamed of, even as a curse on a family for past sins. And the authorities, well, they have been painfully slow in trying to address this issue. In fact, until four years ago, there were no transportation facilities for people with disabilities in the whole of the Ternopil region which has 1.4 million people. So the Happy Wheels ministry is vital. Through it, the church has vividly demonstrated the care and compassion and love of Christ to some of the neediest people in Ternopil. And this has led in turn to many great opportunities to share the life-changing message of the gospel. Now, the current minibus being used is over 19 years old and realistically won't last much longer. 
And without it, the ministry simply couldn't happen. So we are endeavouring to raise, with your help, £15,000 to purchase a replacement minibus. That's our aim. It would be a used vehicle in good condition. It would be purchased from mainland Europe, have sliding doors on both sides, enough seating for nine people and include a lift. And with this new vehicle, the wonderful work of Happy Wheels can keep on going. So why not consider giving something to help this fabulous project? You can do that really easily by going to our website at europeanmission.org forward slash happy wheels. And you know what? We're not very far away from Christmas now, are we? 34 days, in fact, I believe it is. So why not ask family members and friends to make a donation to the Help for Happy Wheels project instead of spending money on something you probably don't need? Wouldn't that be a far better gift? So please help us. And as the Lord leads, please give what you can. Well, it's time now for another short video. And this video is from our uh, colleague, Adam Urban, who is based in Poland. Adam and his wife, Dagmara, became EMF missionaries back in January 2017. Both are in their 20s and come from eastern Poland. And Adam currently serves as the assistant pastor of the Evangelical Church in the town of Szedlce in eastern Poland. This was, in fact, the church through which Adam was converted. Isn't that wonderful? He is now helping to lead the church through which he came to faith. He works alongside the lead pastor, Ben Lair, an American missionary, and they have a tremendous vision and zeal for church planting. There is already a second congregation meeting nearby in the town of Wukov, and another plant is in the pipeline. It's thrilling to see how God is using them and blessing them. So let's find out more as we watch this video. Hello everyone, my name is Adam Urban and together with my wife Dagmara we serve in the local church in Siedlce. Siedlce is located in eastern Poland between Warsaw and the border with Belarus. Excluding Warsaw, Siedlce is one of the biggest cities in, east, in central eastern Poland with a population of 80,000. The church in Siedlce was started from scratch in 2004 by American family Ben and Sarah Leyer. Over the years, the church was growing in numbers pretty regularly. In 2013, I moved with my wife to Scotland to study theology and when I came back, since 2016, I've been working with Ben as an assistant pastor. In the last four years, we had six baptisms, and at the moment in the church there are 38 members plus some regular attenders. In Szedce we have a morning service at 10.30 and from March 2020 we stream our full services online. Now we'll be working on the quality of it. Uh, we are planning to replace the background behind the preacher and uh, stream the services using a semi-professional broadcasting so software. In our experience, this is the best way, in our context, to get in touch with people outside the church. Online ministry. I would say that in 9 of 10 cases, if people came to our church, it was because of our website and our YouTube channel or our Facebook. That is why in 2020 we also started a website that is called the Gospel in the Center, where Christians can find various resources like articles, book reviews, ebooks, video courses, and podcasts. For now, all of those resources are translated from English and mainly, mainly come from Nine Marks, Desiring God, and some 
from the Gospel Coalition Ministries. Uh, since the end of 2012, we also have been planting a church in Wukov, which is a half an hour journey south from Sherdice. Wukov is twice smaller than Sherdice, but there is a literally no evangelical church there. For nearly seven years, we had a very limited fruit. People used to attend for some time and then they would disappear. But in 2019, we baptized five people and soon we are going to register something like a mission station in Wukov. We also would like to plant another church in Sokov Podlaski, which is also about half an hour journey from Shetce, but north. Sokov is a bit smaller than Wukov, but there are about 20,000 people and there is no evangelical church there. Three members of our church in Shetce come from this area. One of them is Marcin, who has the potential to even become a pastor there, though he certainly needs some training. He's so ready to serve the Lord and to do evangelistic work uh, in this town that he bought a house that he's going to renovate and he's going to share it with a purpose to start regular church meetings there. At the moment he lives in Germany where he works in order to earn money to renovate the house and start the church plant there. So we would really appreciate that if, if you could remember marching in your prayers, uh, pray that we'll be able to lead him in his theological training, pray that we'll be able to plant a church in Sokov Podlaski, pray that, uh, pray for the growth of the church in Wukov and Shedice, and pray for for the progress of our whole, whole online ministry. I hope you find this very brief update encouraging. Thank you and God bless you. Well, wasn't that encouraging? Please do continue to pray for Adam and Ben and Marchin and all of their endeavors for the gospel there in the incredibly needy land of Poland. My, we're moving from the land of Poland back to its next door neighbor, the country of Ukraine. And we're going to listen to EMF missionary Vitaly Mariash. Vitaly is married to Luda and they have two children and they live in the city of Kiev. Vitaly is part of the leadership team of their local church and also serves as the academic dean of Kiev Theological Seminary. And this is a great theological college which has been instrumental in training up and sending out hundreds of pastors and church planters. And because of his key role within the seminary, Vitaly is perfectly placed to speak on the issue of biblical teaching in an online world. So, Vitaly, thank you for joining us. It's over to you. Good afternoon, my dear sisters and brothers, and I am very honored to talk to you and to tell a little bit about our seminary and about uh, how we try to uh, reach uh, students uh, in uh, such circumstances. And uh, as you, you have already heard that pandemic and quarantine have created many challenges uh, for Christian church as well as many possibilities. It has created not the same but uh, very similar uh, challenges and opportunities for Christian seminaries and colleges about which uh, I would like to talk a little bit. My talk will consist of uh, three parts. In my first part I would like to tell you about uh, our institution to give you a very broad picture so that you might better understand that we are already doing and uh, how it is related to that we are about to do in the near future. In my second session, I would like to share about our philosophy of uh, uh, education, Christian education and uh, and about the direction that education seems to take. And finally, I will share some new plans about uh, our, our ministry, online ministry. So uh, 
a few words uh, about uh, Kiev Theological Seminary. During uh, 70 years of communist uh, regime, Ukraine had no formal educational uh, theological institution at all. And Kiev Theological Seminary was founded uh, in 1995 by uh, Anatoly Prokopchuk, our uh, first president. The goal was uh, clear to establish an institution uh, that would provide a strong theological education. Uh, classes began uh, in February 1996. In the late uh, uh, 2000s, KTS began adding a master's level program. In 25 years since uh, its founding, KTS has uh, graduated 688 students from its program. Hundreds of other Christians uh, have also received training from our seminary and uh, ministering throughout Ukraine and uh, the former Soviet Union countries uh, as pastors, uh, elders, teachers, uh, youth workers, uh, church planters, chaplains uh, and uh, missionaries. Through studies at KTS, uh, the Lord has called uh, many to the work of church planting. And uh, God has uh, used these uh, former students uh, uh, to start more than 120 churches. Currently, KTS run eight undergraduate programs and they are Biblical studies, uh, Christian education, youth ministry, pastoral leadership, chaplaincy, world mission, church planting, and uh, church ministry. And uh, also we have two graduate master programs, biblical counseling and biblical and theological studies, uh, which run in partnership with the uh, Talbot School of Theology. It's a Biola University, uh, which is located in the United States, in uh, California. Uh, we do not have full-time students. Up to 2014 we had, but uh, we gave it up uh, for some uh, reasons. Now we teach uh, uh, so-called hybrid courses. Just to explain it, uh, our students come in uh, to the seminary campus uh, four times a year. So they have four sessions, two courses uh, each session. One session, two courses, and uh, the duration of one course is two, approximately two and a half months with one week lecture on the seminary campus. Students have uh, different assignments and activities before lectures and some other assignments uh, after. And this model of education is called hybrid. And such courses uh, we call as well hybrid courses. As you can see, most of our activities uh, were already taking place online. And when the pandemic came, arrived, we had uh, to think how to transmit only face-to-face -face section uh, of courses to online format. As soon as we tried to teach, uh, uh, as we used to, just 36 hours in one week of lectures, <laughs> immediately the problems appeared. Some students tended even to drop the courses, the classes, then take them online. So we have approached to the uh, second part of my presentation. We had uh, not completely, but uh, uh, to adjust our online uh, part of lectures to the new circumstances because you have to learn a lot of uh, a, a lot of new skills technical for example uh, uh, you have to use such things as elgato cam link and uh, you have to know how to use obs studio it's an open broadcast uh, uh, software just to facilitate such uh, online um, uh, courses and uh, a lot of other things uh, even more difficult to try 
to develop not technical skills, but uh, um, just to change our thinking because uh, to teach uh, offline, uh, it's much easier as uh, we have understood uh, very quickly because uh, to organize uh, online lecture demands more time, more, en more energy, more skills uh, to be present with your students uh, uh, throughout all the process of uh, two and a half months. So we've been thinking a lot about uh, during those times and uh, we've been planning a lot. And uh, in my second section, I would like to tell a little bit. So our seminary's goal of developing online education programs does not fundamentally um, change our philosophy of education. We have believed for a long time that uh, the hybrid um, model is best in our circumstances. But uh, as soon as uh, quarantine and uh, pandemic is uh, finished, we come back to hybrid courses. Now, almost all our courses, they, uh, they are online. But uh, we think, uh, we firmly believe that uh, um, it is essential to the process of Christian uh, education that we have a physical presence of a teacher and uh, his student. So some activities may be and even should be transferred to online format for the sake of having more uh, productive face-to-face -face sessions, but uh, uh, you cannot uh, substitute your physical presence. So, we, and uh, it is essential for our philosophy of Christian education here at KTS. But we want to use uh, online courses in uh, these four ways. First of all, to recruit students for our seminary by developing their taste for Christian studies in, uh, uh, from their homes. And for this purpose, we are going to create free open access online courses on uh, very urgent issues of modernity about family, uh, Jesus life, and uh, a lot of many other courses. And uh, I like this idea that uh, even unchristians, unbelievers can uh, attain the, these courses because uh, uh, that was theology really is for, to give answers to important questions and challenges the modern culture and society put forward. And uh, I'm very pleased that it's going to, to be open even for unchristians and unbelievers. Secondly, to develop certificate programs, not a full degree, but certificate just to, to invite for further studies because of our philosophy that uh, the good uh, Christian education, uh, you cannot uh, gain only through online education. Thirdly, to have some of our hybrid courses for our um, inward uh, needs, internal needs. And uh, fourthly, to create our biblical languages training courses for our new master programs, which we are planning to have for pastors and uh, uh, over uh, biblical language is difficult to study even in hybrid format uh, but uh, our technology present uh, technologies allowed us to take uh, those uh, issues those uh, courses even on in online format and uh, we are going also to uh, develop this uh, this side of uh, christian education so our plans, uh, I can confess that uh, to produce uh, not just amateur uh, online courses, but to produce professional online courses, it costs a lot. And we've been praying and we've been just thinking uh, from where should this uh, money comes, funds comes. But our plans have coincided with some blessings from the Lord and we have found partners who are ready to invest in this uh, uh, development of hours of uh, online education. We have even been able to create position 
of a director of our online education in our seminary and this man uh, who worked in a secular institution with the, the same task. Now he is working for the seminary, developing this, uh, this part of uh, seminaries ministry. For our, uh, for our task, uh, for hybrid courses, as well as for uh, online courses, we use um, Moodle. It's a learning management software and I have created very short video to take you inside of one of uh, the, this course, just to have uh, you, you uh, to give you some taste, uh, because you cannot enter this directly. Providing you become a, a seminary student, then you can go straight to the course. And I would uh, I, I would like to ask Martin to uh, show this uh, short video. Uh, show you our seminary site. I'm going to a company in the task. As you can see, Moodle. It's a learning management software we are using. There are different uh, type of that, but we use Moodle. And I go straight to the site, which is connected to our seminary site. And you can see different courses, available courses. They are organized in such a way that uh, undergraduate programs under one section and graduate programs for different. And uh, within that section, there are under section, which uh, uh, have courses in different semesters, autumn 2020, spring 2021, their current semester, and uh, you can see different courses, hermeneutics, introductory courses, church history, and the same, the same principle we can see in our master section for master program. Uh, but now let me take you inside uh, of one of course, it's a research method course. On the top of uh, the course, uh, we can see a big blue button program, which is incorporated to Moodle. It's similar to Zoom, Skype. The, our professors can use it for video parts, video section, of course, video seminars, lectures, and all uh, activities, they are organized in weekly format. Uh, for example, uh, we take, we go to uh, this weekend, uh, for example, they have uh, <laughs> forums. It's a very popular and very useful tool for online courses. You can see students um, participating in forums. They can discuss different uh, um tasks uh, different assignments they put the their question they share their experience uh, they discuss uh, uh, some questions with professors and um, there are also video lecture for example let me take to one of them so you can see the file i'm not going straight to the file but uh, when you click so it pops up and uh, students just follow and make uh, the assignment. So they listen to the lecture and uh, uh, put uh, these uh, assignments to the different uh, file repository, for example, like that. Here we are, you click and all your assignment write in and so you have to submit here. And in this format, we organized all our courses, hybrid as well as uh, online. So let me now finish this section and uh, proceed to my main presentation. Apart from this uh, development of online courses, online format, uh, as pandemic came to Ukraine, we tried to reach our students 
and uh, support them in uh, some other ways. We have decided to, cre to create live streaming events on Facebook and uh, we had our professors given testimonies about how they came to Christ, how the Lord has called them to teach in our seminary. We had also prepared some discussions on the important topics our students interested in. If, uh, for example, uh, you can see now pictures uh, I prepared that was uh, from that one of that event. And you can see how many viewers uh, just uh, participated in that event. Uh, around uh, 1,000 uh, people, not only students, I suppose. I have never preached to such a big congregation, but in internet it's possible. And uh, in the end of my presentation, I would like to share something uh, which even uh, uh, not many people in Ukraine know. So it's not secret, but uh, it very, uh, um, very few people know about our plans as, uh, as a seminary. We would like to uh, establish new undergraduate program called Media Ministry. As we were thinking and planning and praying how effectively, effectively to use uh, these uh, tools uh, of online education, one idea was always coming back to us again and again. If there are so many people, especially young people, ready to watch Facebook or YouTube streaming, why do not prepare ministers, uh, ministers for such audience? As a seminary, we are not uh, ready to invest huge amount of time and effort in such activities. Also, we do uh, try to make something, but we also made a small research on the subject, how, many, how much time young people spend on the internet. So the average time spent uh, uh, online for an average young person in Ukraine, I do not know about other countries, I do not think it differs too much. So uh, up to 28 years old in Ukraine is almost uh, five hours from four to five hours a day young people are spending on uh, time in internet. How can we reach those young people? And for this reason, uh, Kyiv Theological Seminary is going to begin a new undergraduate unique program, Media Discipleship, which can help to develop good professional skills for online media space. Future students will learn how to preach on online video sermon, how to lead discussions for online audience. They will learn, learn how to develop a quality media product that is unique among others. Because as far as I know, there is no such, uh, there is not such a program uh, in um, in Ukraine, there are some which prepare for this for TV, for radio, but for YouTube, go vlogging, for uh, Facebook live streaming, there is no such. But a huge amount of young people they are just uh, spending, as we have heard, uh, four from four to five hours a day, and we would like to reach those uh, people, and therefore we. Uh, create, we would like to uh, organize to create this uh, um, media ministry program. And uh, I would like you to ask, uh, uh, I would like to ask you to pray about uh, these efforts and uh, um, about uh, this good fruits this effort might produce as well. And if you know such, uh, some people who are Christian people who can uh, help us with ideas and share them, come to us and to teach, uh, to be involved in this program, you are very welcome. So it's our future plan about how to reach and to use our seminary uh, to reach uh, unreached, to prepare ministers even uh, for media space, for online space. Thank you for your attention that uh, everything I prepared to, to tell about. Thank you very much for your attention.
The church in Alcázar de San Juan has experienced uh, sad and trying times because of the pandemic. Uh, six uh, families from the church have lost uh, loved ones and therefore has been a very complex and difficult time for us as a, as a church. Uh, there was uh, a funeral of one of the ladies from the church who died and it was quite uh, complicated um, at the cemetery with few relatives and the time there was very short. At the end of May, uh, we were able to meet back again in person and we are grateful to God for that. We will ask your prayers so that we might continue with this uh, in-person ministry and there is nothing like that, like that. Also, the young people have been meeting uh, person to person and the prison ministry has also been resumed at the beginning of July. At first, we found that the people were very hesitant uh, to meet, uh, to come, um, to be with us. But then, uh, as time went by, they also began to attend. And at the present time, we have quite a number attending. So we are grateful to God for that and ask your prayers for, for them. We are grateful to the Lord that we have an ongoing online ministry that of late has been taken care of by the young people of the church. Uh, to start with the YouTube channels that we have three, one of them with the preaching from the Sunday services and another one with evangelistic clips and another one that has the TV programs and uh, also the Facebook and the Instagram is uh, young people are doing, taking care of that. We also have the Twitter and uh, uh, we are trying to use other means as well. And we have noticed an increase of people watching in this way. And uh, we will ask your prayers for this ministry that we believe not only is good for the local church, but for the church in Spain and also across the Atlantic. We have noticed uh, a number of people being able to watch what we've been doing uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. And uh, we ask for your prayers as we have been able to conduct uh, webinars in English and also in Spanish. And we have seen quite a number of interest in that. Also, the uh, ministry of the Sunday School has been has gone on online. And we would ask your prayers for that to continue as well in this way. It is wonderful to see the children been interested in this uh, ministry online. Well, thank you, Pepe, and of course, thank you so much, Vitaly. It's my pleasure now to introduce Andrew Roycroft, a native of Northern Ireland, which obviously means he is a good man. Uh, he's married to Carolyn and they have two daughters. Uh, Andrew is a writer, a blogger, poet, conference speaker, and he's been the pastor of Malayal Baptist Church since 2010. Now, like the rest of Northern Ireland, Malayal is a very beautiful place. Uh, it's a very small village on the Ards Peninsula in County Down. And perhaps his biggest claim to fame is that one Amy Carmichael, the amazing missionary to India, was born there and has connections to the church. So this is a church with a great heritage. And over the last number of years, the fellowship there has grown steadily, both spiritually and numerically. And one increasingly important feature in the life of the church has been online ministry. And in our closing address today, Andrew is going to take us back to the scriptures to help us think through how we can address the challenge of sharing the gospel in an online world. So, Andrew, thank you. It's over to you. Thank you so much, Phil, for your welcome. And thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to share with you today at this afternoon's conference. It's been such a blessing to listen to the missionary reports and to listen to John's ministry as well. I want to read some verses of scripture with you just now and I'd appreciate it if you could turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 17 of that chapter down to the 6th verse of chapter 3. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, commencing to read at verse 17. The Apostle Paul writing here to the church in Thessalonica says, But since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face 
because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it came to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labour would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. We'll close our reading there at verse 6 of First Thessalonians 3. 2020 has carried all kinds of surprises and all kinds of new experiences, some of them welcome and some of them not. But one of the lovely surprises of this year has been the return of interest in space travel. I remember as a boy following eagerly the space shuttles that took off in the United States of America with all their triumphs and with all their tragedies. And recently, um, SpaceX have been showing us footage of rockets launching to go to the International Space Station. It's made for compelling viewing. The footage is in high definition and we feel almost when we watch it that we're going to space with the astronauts. We can see the science, we can marvel at the technology and the sheer human ingenuity that allows that kind of travel to take place. One of the big factors behind all of that happening is a set of guidelines called launch commit criteria. These are the circumstances in which a rocket or a shuttle may safely and permissibly take off. The factors that are taken into account are wind speed and direction, visibility, cloud formations and types, and the proximity of storms to the launch site both before and after it's due to take place. If any of these is slightly out, then the launch is off. The rocket cannot go that particular day or at that particular hour. Sometimes we're tempted to think in similar terms when it comes to gospel work and when it comes to evangelism and mission. We tend to quietly and implicitly believe that if we undertake what we have to do for the Lord in anything less than ideal circumstances, then we can't really expect to succeed or we can't really expect to effectively serve God unless conditions are just right. That's partly fed by the how-to and guru culture um, that's all around us. The success of other people becomes the benchmark for us and for our ministry and for our mission. The problem with all of that thinking is that the New Testament flatly contradicts it. The New Testament is full of examples of mission and ministry undertaken in the midst of contingency, undertaken in the midst of setbacks and unwelcome surprises. Much of the ministry in the New Testament takes place against opposition and persecution and pain and even relationship breakdowns and missionary attrition and political interference. So rather than best practice, what we often encounter in the New Testament is more like a living example of Murphy's Law, where what can go wrong will go wrong. And yet the friction, the resistance of circumstance and setback, we find is often the force that God uses to affect his purposes, to save his people, to build his church. We're thinking today about ministry in an online world. And when we do that, we often talk about it as our last resort. We come to it with a sense of necessity and resignation and recognition that we can't do anything else really. But we are seeking to reassure ourselves today that God is sovereign and that God is still working. In my session just now, I want to look specifically at something that John alluded to earlier in his message. How much of our knowledge of and scripture from the New Testament era are the result of what we might describe as plan B. I want to look with you first of all today at contingency problems and then I want to talk to you about contingency plans. That's the structure for what I'll share with you this afternoon. So first of all let's think together in New Testament terms about contingency problems. If we think that we have problems and obstacles in our ministry we really ought to spare a thought for the writers of the New Testament. Over and over again, they had recourse to technology in terms of writing because they didn't have access to the luxury of meeting. 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, many of the documents that we have in our Bibles come because <clears throat> at a human level, things didn't go quite as people would have wished. Take the Thessalonian church, for example. Paul's ministry there in Acts 17 was breathtakingly brief. He ministered for three Sabbaths in the synagogue and so his time scale there would have been three or a maximum of four weeks. The result of his ministry was a handful of Jewish converts, some prominent women from the city and more converts from the God-fearing Gentiles or Greeks. And then, boom, just like that, ministry and mission terminated. He had to effect a nighttime escape and there were political and potentially fatal forces pushing against this new church plant. What does Paul do with these young Christians living as they are in a hostile environment, facing what seem to be insuperable problems? Well, he prays for them night and day. He sends Timothy to get a report and he writes to them. We'll see more about that in a moment. Now, as much as we, we value these writings now, as much as we see that God conspired their context and inspired their content, for Paul and for the other writers of the New Testament, virtual was always trumped by personal. So Paul writes to the Romans, one of the fullest and finest presentations of the gospel that he preached. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 10, he, he says that he mentions the Romans always in his prayers, asking specifically that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. He wants them to know that his preferred medium is face to face. We can see the same on the part of the Apostle John. He, he writes these three letters that are abounding and wealth of wisdom. He, he teaches us the difference between true and false faith, between true and false fellowship. He, he describes and delineates the bonds of Christian love and, and the brilliance of God's redemptive plan. But John sees contingency here. At a personal level, in Second John 12, he writes these words, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. He repeats that in 3 John 13, where he says, I had much to write to you, but I'd rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we'll talk face to face. Now, these elements combined show to us that God was at work when his servants couldn't do as they wished. But the struggle was real. They felt a limitation. They felt that the jurisdiction of their ministry was restricted by circumstance and by opposition. And pen and ink was used to bridge a gap until they could close it by being with others in person. So the New Testament admits of these contingency problems. But I want to think then, second of all, this afternoon about contingency plans. If we get glimpses at times of frustration on the part of the writers of the New Testament, we get a greater view of a sense of fruition on the part of God. The very things that these people saw as obstacles were the ways in which God worked. So Paul might not have been able to be in Thessalonica, but his writings under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit come to us with the force and the power of God himself. They shine a light on the nature of conversion, the nature of suffering, the nature of holiness the nature of Christ's coming, the nature of hope and joy and life and love in Christ Jesus. And so where Paul saw plan B, God was sovereignly sticking to plan A, fulfilling his purpose, giving his word and donating wealth to his people across the ages. Paul may not have been able to reach Rome. His prayers day and night might have been that God would open that door, but instead God unleashed his pen and through him elucidated his gospel, left us an inspired legacy of writing which is charged with the challenge and the truth and the beauty of God himself. So Paul and other writers took the media at their disposal and they used it to the full, but they also suited it to their purpose. And so in the New Testament letters, we, we find that this, this medium is, is utilised, but it's also transformed. So simple things like greetings could be extrapolated and expanded to teach on the nature of Christian fellowship and community. Household codes with their, their strict sense of moralism could be transformed to show how union with Christ changes the basic units of how Christians relate to one another. The, the vice and virtue lists 
of Greek letter writing format become this living and vibrant and fruitful and organic outworking of the gospel in the life of the Christian. And Paul's not afraid of using complex literary forms in his letters in order that his message might be made clearer and might be applied more fully and closely to his hearers. Jeffrey Wyma has said this, Paul is a gifted writer who has both the freedom and the creative ability to shape and adapt those conventions of Greek letter writing so that they more effectively strengthen his persuasive purposes at work in the letter. And so Paul, knowing he couldn't be with these people, understood that God was sovereign both in the matter and the medium and in the message, and he writes in such a way that transformed that medium. Greek letters could be used for great evil, but God would use this forum for the great good of his church in all ages and the glory of his name eternally. So what lessons can we learn from this for ourselves in terms of ministry in an online world? Well, we'd want to put a caveat in place right away. We are not apostles. And the significance of the obstacles we face and the solutions we find will never match those of Paul or John or any of the other New Testament writers. We need to understand that this was a unique moment and a unique manner in which God used those hindrances as a way of forwarding and furthering his work. But we can draw broad principles from how the apostles approached that contingency. Let me suggest um, three injunctions that we could apply to our hearts as we think about ministry in the online world. First of all, we should accept the limits. We should accept that very often ministry is composed of frustrated moments that add up into a mosaic of God's purpose being fulfilled. And grasping that relieves us of so much of the pressure that we can put on ourselves to have that launch criteria for perfect ministry. Whenever William Carey was on route to India to undertake that great missionary enterprise there, the journey at the end became extremely taxing. His biographer says that there was not much for them to see as they travelled. And towards the end of the journey, the captain of the ship that Carey was on allowed him to come up to the poop deck and observe seafaring and navigation. And what Carey saw there, he then translated into a lesson for Christian life and Christian ministry. Listen to what Carey says about obstacles. For near a month, we have been within 200 miles of Bengal. But the violence of the currents sets us back from the very door. I hope I have learned the necessity of bearing up in the things of God against wind and tide. We have had our port in view all along and every attention has been paid to solar and lunar observations, no opportunity being neglected. Oh, that I was as attentive. A ship sails within six points of the wind. If the wind blows from the north, a ship will sail east-northeast on one tack and west-northwest on the other. If our course, therefore, is north, we must go east northeast for a considerable time, then west northwest. If the wind shifts a point, advantage is immediately taken. Now, this is tedious work, and if the current be against us, we scarcely make any way. Now, sometimes, in spite of all we do, we go backwards. Yet it is absolutely necessary to keep working up if we mean to arrive at port. So, we Christians have to work against wind and currents, and we must if we are to make our harbour. I love Kerry's perspective there. I love this parable of seafaring where sometimes we have to go in a divergent direction than we would have chosen to reach our final destination. And so where we have been forced online, where the coordinates of our ministry in 2020 are so different from those we would have plotted for ourselves, we know that the destination sure as we submit to God, even if the immediate means don't feel right. So we should accept the limits. Secondly, we should adopt what's available. For the Apostle Paul and for other New Testament writers, as John alluded to earlier on, the, the Greek letter combined with the Roman road was a great way of communicating with local churches. And just as the internet in our day can be used for all sorts of nefarious and evil purposes, so too could letters. The Apostle Paul knew this for himself because it was via letters that he was going to persecute the church in Damascus. And yet the medium itself is ambivalent. The medium itself is morally neutral. And Paul could adopt that letter writing format. As we've come to understand Paul's writing style more and more over the centuries, we see even some of the rhetorical devices that he could use that were common currency. 
He understood that these were great tools to be used for the glory of God. And he became, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, proficient in engaging those kinds of speech patterns and units to communicate the truth effectively. Of course, we're not going to write scripture, but we should adopt what's available to us today. The lockdown that we've come through and the future of online ministry, yes, is is bordered by perils on every side, but it's a deeply enriched medium that we can use for the glory of God. And so we should see that as a as a as a portal, as a as a way that God has opened for us to get the word out. So we should accept the limits when things aren't as we would wish them. See that this is how God works. Let's plot northeast if we have to in order to reach the true north eventually. We should adopt what's available just as the apostles did, and we should adapt it at will. Not only did did Paul use letters for the immediate contingencies. But his writing of Greek letters transformed that medium for good. It transformed it in terms of its purpose, its reach, its function and its longevity. And we have the opportunity to adapt the tools that are around us so we can increasingly learn the capacities that they have and exploit them to their absolute maximum and to their absolute full. So that the simple ministry we provide in one place can reach many hundreds if not thousands of more people. And we should be constantly seeking to see what innovations we can bring on board to further adapt and develop that. And so ministry in an online world, taking these lessons from the New Testament, is yes, of course, a hindrance. And of course, it's difficult. And the New Testament writers bristled against the, the, the limit of not being able to be with believers. But this is a glorious opportunity. Let's face those contingency problems. Let's be honest about them in mission and in the local church. But then let's see the contingency plans that we can put in place. Let's see what God can do through even broken medium, even through broken servants, to declare his gospel and to get all the glory. Thank you for listening this afternoon. Thank you for having me at this conference today. And I trust that the Lord will bless us, each and every one. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, for that enlightening and really encouraging message from from God's Word. I hope you've all found today's conference uh, interesting and helpful. Uh, Apologies for some imperfections in the uh, technology. Uh, We're in an online world, but it's not a perfect online world. So apologies for uh, some network problems at some points there. Thank you for your patience with us. And can I just say as well regarding the Christmas project that Phil was sharing about uh, help for Happy Wheels uh, so that we can help to get that replacement vehicle for Velodia and their ministry there in Ternopil. Um, So at the end of this uh, online conference today, uh, the information about that will be coming on our screens again. So if any of you are interested in contributing towards that project or uh, asking more about it, As I say, uh, you will be seeing the information again uh, right at the end, uh, just in a few minutes time. But before we conclude our time together this afternoon, uh, let me just share with you a brief update on our EMF missionaries. Uh, About one in every eight of our EMF missionaries have either tested positive for COVID or have had symptoms of the virus, with at least two of them having to spend some time in hospital. And sadly, one of our retired missionaries in Poland, Daniela Karszewek, passed away at the beginning of this week. So our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Henrik, uh, her husband and the family, uh, after losing Daniela to COVID earlier this week. Uh, And most of the churches where our missionaries are serving uh, have also been affected, like most of our churches, by COVID. Uh, with all the rules and restrictions that we've all had to get used to, uh, numbers at meetings being very limited of, of often, and quite a few church services and other activities uh, either being forced to go online or even being cancelled altogether. And a number of other EMF missionaries have been experiencing other serious health issues. But we have also heard throughout this time of a number of real encouragements people hearing the gospel, and some coming to faith, sometimes even as a direct result of churches going online. 
believers getting to know each other better through all sorts of online meetings, opportunities to reach out with practical help to people suffering the financial consequences of COVID. And we're also in touch with an encouraging number of young men, especially from several different countries who believe that the Lord is calling them to gospel work in Europe. And we've seen the Lord providing in wonderful ways for the needs of our missionaries and, and for our needs as a mission, often through those extra sacrifices of people like you and of churches like yours. Talking of which, uh, if you want to know how you could help, not just EMF, but gospel work in Europe, well, here are a few simple ideas for you to consider. So there we have a few ways in which uh, you can partner with EMF uh, in gospel work in Europe. Partnering with EMF through your prayers and your giving if you're able to. Uh, secondly, uh, you could partner with a missionary. We're trying to encourage churches and individuals uh, to partner with specific missionaries uh, in different countries uh, of Europe. And why not think of inviting an EMF missionary? I'm sure some of you have already done this. And experience the benefits of it. Uh, invite an EMF missionary to join uh, your meeting, whether that's an in-person meeting, as we call it now, uh, or an online Zoom deputation meeting or whatever. So these are some ways uh, in which uh, we can partner together uh, for the progress of the gospel in Europe. And then let me just tell you about our next webinar. Uh, due to be held on Monday, the 11th of January, the Lord permitting. Uh, so let's just uh, look at this slide here, which tells us about that. Uh, on the 11th of January, God willing, probably it's 1930 hours. Uh, yes, that evening. Uh, and it's going to be about something that we don't always or even often talk about, which is the role of women, the important role of women, be they single missionaries or pastors, wives or whatever, so we're going to be thinking about that, uh, the key role of women in gospel work in Europe and how we can support them. And we're going to be helped in thinking about that uh, by these four sisters uh, on the slide here. Jean Woods, for many years a missionary with EMF in Spain. Uh, Pilar Herrera, the wife of Luis Cano in the church in Ciudad Real. Uh, Vivian Birch, uh, my better half, in case you didn't know. And Jenny Mariotti whom we've already seen this afternoon uh, with Stefano talking about the work in Budrio. So let me encourage you to put that in your diary uh, for the 11th of January, God willing, uh, 7.30 in the evening that day. And so you'll, you can get more information about that, I'm sure, nearer the time. So as we draw to a close, uh, thank you again for joining us today. And let's just pray together as we conclude today's conference. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you once again for your amazing sovereignty. We believe in that. We believe that you're in control uh, of all the circumstances of our lives and of the whole world, even at a time of pandemic, like the time we're living through right now. We praise you for your providence. We thank you for the message of the gospel that you've given to us, the good news, the best news in the world, the news about how sinners like us can be saved thanks to your Son and our blessed Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've called us as Christians and as churches and as missionary organisations uh, to do everything we can to make the gospel known to, in this case, the people of Europe and all over the world. Lord, renew our vision uh, for doing that, not just for Europe, but give us a global vision for mission work all over the world. And uh, tell us uh, how you would have us to be involved in gospel work, whether in Europe or somewhere else in the world or both, as well as in our own home situations. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful, to grow in faithfulness. Thank you for what we've been reminded of today from your word by our two speakers from your word. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be encouraged by what they've shared with us and at the same time challenged to renew our commitment to take the gospel to the 733 million people of our own continent, as well as helping in the other continents of the world 
Lord, we pray these things and that you would bring fruit from today's conference in our hearts and lives and in the cause of the gospel here in the UK, throughout the rest of the Europe, all over the world. Lord, we pray that you would get glory for your great name through these means. For we pray in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again so much for taking the time to join us today. And we do hope to see you again soon. Thank you.